Hello everyone, today we will discuss on the topic the quasi static snail. So, what we will do is we will take up the question that how slow is slow. Now, this is the question that has almost baffled all of us while studying quasi static processes that is, how slowly do they proceed? So, what we will do is we will try to answer this question how slow is slow, and then we will try to apply this to some practical examples. So, let's begin with it. Now, concentrate on these two statements. It is possible to perform expansion or compression reversibly if we do it sufficiently slowly or quasi-statically. Of course, it would take infinite amount of time for a strictly reversible process to occur. So most of the process we term reversible are approximations to the real thing. Now concentrate on the word approximations. So how exactly do we make these approximations? Or in other words, how slow is slow? So now what we'll try to do is we'll try to construct an analog, an analog from calculus and then apply it to practical thermodynamics. We are doing this because I believe that the question how slow is slow is very similar to the question that how small is small dx. So let's begin with it. Suppose I ask you to calculate the square of 10,001. What most of you will do is something like this, 10,001 into 10,001 and you get so and so answer but you know this is a tedious and a lengthy process. So what I do is I hire a mathematician and I ask him to construct a machine. A machine that calculates squares for me. And he makes one. Based on a very simple principle y is equals to x into x where x is our input and y is our output. But this mathematician tries to be over smart with me. What he says that he can make another machine that can actually work faster than this. I say okay make one and he makes this. Now this machine is based on a very simple principle from calculus y is equal to x squared differentiate it what we get small change in y is equal to 2x into small change in x. Now what he does he takes 10,000 as our base value and the values 10,001, 1.1, 1.2 and so on as our secondary values. Then he calculates dx that is 1, 1.1, 1 .1, 1 1.2 for each of these values. Now using the formula given here y2 minus y1 2 into x1 into x2 minus x1 what he does he calculates y square. But he forgets that I'm a physics student and I have the habit of checking my machines. So what I do I compare the outputs of these two machines and the outputs look something like that. Now you see the results are ambiguous. The results are ambiguous because the results of these two machines vary from each other. And if you're smart enough, you might have already seen this, that if we go away and away from 10,000, the difference between the outputs of these two machines go on increasing, as I've shown in this plot. Now, why does this ambiguity arise? Uh, the reason is very simple. Let's go back to the first principles. y is equal to s square, y plus dy is equal to x plus dx whole square, expand it, neglecting dx square and you get the answer. Now here is where the ambiguity arises. See the term dx has some finite value. So does dx square. And as dx goes on increasing, dx square also goes on increasing. So as we get further and further away from 10,000, the deviation of our second machine actually increases from our true value. Now what we do is now let us apply this analog to a practical problem. Let us consider the problem of reversible compression. Now what happens in a reversible compression that when we press the piston a pressure wave is sent throughout the system. I have shown this pressure wave with the help of a red arrow now what happens this pressure wave takes a finite time from the end to reach the end of the tube from the end of the piston. What if we press the piston fast enough so that there is another pressure wave at the same time in the system. Then the system will be non-uniform and it will actually deviate from reversibility. So how slow we should move, move the pistons so that the pressure actually is same everywhere throughout the system. Let us take a practical example. See, for the room temperature here, the sound speed is approximately 340 meters per second and that is, that is the speed of our pressure wave. Now if we assume that at a particular instant that the piston is 100 millimeters from the closed end of the cylinder, 
that the change in pressure due to the piston motion will be communicated in about 0.29 milliseconds. Now, if during this 0.29 milliseconds, the piston moves very little x, the pressure can be assumed to be uniform throughout the system for all practical purposes. And this is how we mimic a quasi-static process. Now, let's apply our analog to this. Now, first of all, what we do is we rename our machine in terms of thermodynamics. The machine y is equal to x into x becomes our theoretical machinery, whereas the machine dy to equals to x dx, that is the approximation to the real machine, becomes our experimental machine. Now you can smell thermodynamics coming in. See, the experimental machinery is just an approximation, whereas the theoretical machinery is the one which gives us the actual real outputs, means very, very precise outputs, what happens at most of the times in thermodynamics. Now, as we've seen earlier, that the, for the experimental machinery to be as near as to the theoretical machine, dx should be very small. Now the same principle applies to this problem. But here the dx is renamed. Here the dx is the distance moved by the piston. Should be very small for the process to be very near to reversibility. Okay. Well, now this thing creates one more doubt in us. Now how small should be dx for a proper result? Well, that depends on what you call a proper result. Okay. Now concentrate on this statement. We define a quasi-static or quasi-equilibrium process to be a process that happens sufficiently slowly that de departures from thermodynamic equilibrium are always so small that they can be neglected. Now concentrate on the word neglected. So how do we neglect these quantities? Let's see. Now let us assume that the machines which we had earlier give output on a screen on a screen that is very much similar to your calculator screen. By the way, this screen has a limitation that it can display just eight digits. Now these eight digits are what you call a proper result. Now let us do one thing. Let us analyze the results of these two machines as we can see on the screen. So here are those results. And you might see that all the results are the same. Now. The reason is very simple. What happened that the square which we had earlier was actually of nine digits. So when you make it short, that is you make it just of eight digits, the uncertainty to the last digits vanishes out. So as long as dx square does not influence the second last digit, our results are going to be correct. So what if, if we calculate 10,004 square? then the results on our screens would be different. As you can see here, there is an extra one digit coming at the once place. Now the reason is very simple. Suppose dx is 3, then 3 ka square is 9. Now here the dx is 4. 4 ka square is 16. 16 has two digits. 3 has 3 ka square has 9, has one digit. So it does not appear. Whereas in the case of 16, it appears on our screen. Therefore, we conclude for that for the result to remain consistent with the second machine, dx should be less than or equals to 3. Now, this is giving us a very subtle point. A point that the upper limit on dx, that is, it should be such that it doesn't show up on our screen. Or in other words, it actually rhymes with the thermodynamic statement that its contribution can be neglected. So the contributions to our results can be neglected in this way. Now let us apply this to a practical example that is Richard's method to determine the value of gamma. Now Richard's method used the equation of PV to the power gamma is equal to constant, that is the common adiabatic equation. Now let's see how adiabatic and reversible conditions are met in this experiment. First, let's give you a brief re overview of our experiments. So the thing is that there is a constant volume jar with a piston kind of thing in it with a ball in it. When you press the ball, it oscillates. It uh, And we can show by equations that it oscillates simple harmonically. Now where here dv is the change in volume as the ball oscillates. And we, we have the force, f is the restoring force. Now using all these equations, what we can do is we can actually relate the time period to the gamma. So here we get an expression for the gamma in terms of its time period.
Now, since the ball oscillates fairly rapidly, but uh, we consider this to be an adiabatic process, but changes are very small that it can be considered to be equilibrium state. The change of P and V is the change I am talking about. Now let us see at the results of this experiment. Here we perform the experiment for th these three gases where M is the mass, T is the time period, V is the volume, P is the pressure and this is gamma and area. Now when we did some reverse calculations we found out that, that the pressure was changing just by 2% of the total pressure and the volume was roughly changing by 1.5%. So these are the quantities that actually are required to mimic a reversible process. This 2% and 1.5%. This is a measure of how small is small. Now let's compare the results to the theoretical results. As you can see in this table, it very clearly says that the results are inconsistent with our theoretical values. But now let's look at the results in a different way. What we do is we round off the results to two significant digits and you see something like this surprising the results are positive the results are the same now what we have done here is what we have done earlier in the analog is the same what we have done here see thus we can say our apparatus measures gamma only up to two significant figures accurately for the given set of dp and dv now let's go back to our analog. The theoretical machinery gives us an output up to three significant digits, but the experimental machinery is limited just to two significant digits, so that it is well in comparison to our theoretical machinery. So now, the value of dx there limits, limits the size of our screen. For eight-digit accuracy, as we calculated earlier, the dx should be less than or equal to three. So here, the size of our dp and dv has limited the accuracy of our result. So in other words, we have been able to approximate a reversible adiabatic process only up to the above mentioning index. Now you have a feeling that this can be improved. How? Just make your dp or dx smaller. As we, can, we have seen earlier that if dx is very small, dx squared is very small, so the theoretical and the experimental machinery are much in agreement with each other. So is here. So now what I want to do is actually perform experiments and bring out results. And see this analog as a way of understanding how approximations are made in reversible processes. So that was all.